Good evening, and welcome to the sixth and final interview in the Talking Head series. I'm Maeve MacDonnell, and I'm joined by Anne James, Chairperson of the Humanists Association of Ireland. I will conduct the first half of the interview, and my colleague James Martin will conduct the second. There will be questions and answers from the audience at the end. Ms James, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Thank you for the invitation. First of all, can you explain, for the purposes of our audience, what a humanist belief system is? A humanist belief system is a way of looking at the world. It says that we have one, basically one life. You were born, you, you grow, you learn. The world is there to be enjoyed, to work with other people, and then you die. And you leave memories, hopefully. And how would that relate to an atheist belief system? Um, in lots of ways, I mean, here's the atheist, here's the humanist. I mean, a lot of us are the same people. Humanists tend to just think of an actively um, ethical way of looking at the world, a compassionate way of looking at the world. We just think that being a human is something really special and therefore it's something to be treasured. And I'm sure a lot of atheists are exactly the same. It's just that I, I suppose a humanist in some ways, if it's got a big H, have joined. And we're not particularly joiners um, often. They're people who've left things more often. Um, but you talk to a lot of people and tell them what you believe and what you think you know, about the world. And they say, oh, I'm one of those. So there are humanists with little h all around the place. And yourself, I assume you weren't born into a humanist family. How did, how did your own, I suppose, spiritual upbringing mm. begin? Well, I began life in England with a Catholic, an Irish Catholic mother and uh, a fairly non-religious father. Um, and so I was very dutiful, I was a good child, and I did what I was told, and I was told to go to church, and I did, and I loved it. Um, it was quiet, it was peaceful, and we sang songs, I loved it. Um, I, I, as I grew up and developed and b began thinking for myself, I began to think, actually, I'm not sure. I believed in the church. I don't think I ever really believed in a God. I, I didn't, although I used to pray to God because he listened. <laughs> there was somebody up there who listened, and it was mm. the sky, and it was lovely. But uh, no, that, that sort of gradually went away, and then I realized I was the same person. I was just as nice, just as good, just as happy without any of that, and met a fellow atheist and produced two children who were brought up without any religious belief and have turned out incredibly nice men. And did you find it difficult to walk away from, I suppose, the community aspect that often being part of any religion brings? Um, no, it, it was very easy. I, I grew out of hmm. um, the, the church as I grew into my teenage years, and I had friends, um, and your peer group give you more support. Now, I don't remember any of them being religious or not religious. They were just my friends. and. Um, hmm. I, I suppose in England it's a lot easier because religion wasn't a big deal. And of course most of my friends, if they were raised in anything, it would have been the Church of England. Mm. So um, not particularly um, heavy on the you know day-to-day -day religion. Yeah. And would your education have been from a Catholic background or a Catholic schooling? No, no. Mm. I went to a county primary school and we had the um, compulsory daily assembly worship and the same at grammar school. Um, I just managed to skip out of the religious education in grammar school because I was a Catholic, so it was the reverse of here. So I used to trot around the playground until they caught me and sent me to music. Um, so that, that was my experience of that. Mm. And did that, that experience or kind of experience make you feel that, I suppose, education didn't play a big part in influencing your own kind of spiritual beliefs? No, I mean, we were taught, um, no, very little spiritual belief. We, we had nature study, we learned about the world, and, and it was lovely because, because it is. Um, so, so there wasn't much spiritual. I used to like the, the hymn singing 
um, that was great. Uh, very nice singing in a big group of people. So all that was, was very nice, but it didn't... Um, uh, but of course the home side of things would have been different it was very do not do this do not do that do not do this do not do that uh, and that's really what I learned um, mm -hmm. I did go uh, when I went to the grammar school after school to a Catholic class one day a week and um, I don't remember much of what we did to be I actually I have a confession I used to teach catechism <laughs> when I was about 13 or 14 I used yes. to um, which is more about the teaching for me than mm. um, the Did any of, I suppose, what you would have learned in your, in your own teaching of the Catechism, did any of that make you question your own belief in God? Well, in one sense, um, I think I go back to the thing that I'm not sure I actually believed in mm. God. Um, I believed in what I was told to do. Um, so, and, I, and I certainly, I suppose, as, as I began to become think more rationally for myself. I used to see the anomalies and things. And in fact, the, the real turning point for me, my father's family were, had every sort of um, non-Catholic Christian flavor in all his family, and discussing with his brother who was a uh, Jehovah's Witness. And we were arguing the difference between whether there could be three people in one God, which he said, how can that be? And I said, God created everything. What you know, he can be as many people as he likes. Um, uh, and then I began to see actually that's you know, and it, it was from there really that I, I began to see that actually the world was as it is. And how were you introduced to humanism with the capital H as you yeah. described it yourself? <laughs> um, when I started teaching, there was a campaign to end compulsory daily worship mm. in schools, and I thought right right up my street because obviously by then I you know I'd long lost uh, religion um, and I did see a humanist British humanist group then and but the campaign folded and and then it wasn't until just before I came to Ireland I saw a group of humanists in Cambridge and I thought oh they sound great and and they were they were people who really thought about what life was about and and how it should be lived and so as soon as I came to Ireland I had joined up with the Irish humanists and did they give you kind of that community feeling once again of being part of a group of people that are coming together and thinking about life and life's big questions? Yes, I mean in mm. a word that that's what um, that's what I found. Um, there was a little bit when I first joined of oh no we've got oh thank God we're not Catholics anymore. Um, but uh, but you know more and more mm. that is what we find. And and as our we have a, a meeting once a month and as new, it's an open meeting, anybody can come. <clears throat> and people walk through the door and we start talking and they say, oh, I've been looking for you people. <laughs> because it is, people need that community, um, mm. which is why <clears throat> membership is quite important. Yeah. <clears throat> so we're always delighted when people join because it means they've found something. Sometimes people don't want to join, but they're happy enough to say, I'm really glad you exist. And um, perhaps we'll talk more about what we do later, but um, they, they do like the community, knowing there are other people. And how did you yourself become, you're chairperson of, this, of the association now, how did you become, I suppose, involved in the more administrative side or the, uh, the leading? Um, because they couldn't stop me, I think. <laughs> I came, I joined, we met in a corner of a pub and there were half a dozen people and I said, okay, this is fine. And um, gradually we, we moved up a stage until um, the group grew bigger. So almost immediately I was secretary because I said, no, we could do this and we could do that. And I was like, oh, I'll do that and I'll do that. And then people took on different roles. But mm -hmm. I, I'm just, I'm so excited by it, basically. And I still am after um, nearly 12 years here. I'm very excited by it. And uh, I said, if we can ever find anybody to take on the secretary role, at least mm -hmm. that's one thing off the list. Yeah. And so when I got around, right, I said, would you be chair? Oh, fine. <laughs> and you've recently been, named, uh, been on a chaplain. Could you tell us more about what that role involves? Yes, well, um, what it actually involves at the moment, I'm not quite sure, we're, we're mm. still early days, but I can tell you how it came about, really, that we'd have our Sunday meetings, and 
we have a document called, called our equality document and there are all sorts of issues where we feel there's privilege given to people of faith, of any faith, uh, being superior to people with no faith. And there is in Ireland especially a presumption that you have a religion. So we'd have members, uh, and, and non-believers and colleagues who, who would be in hospital and approached by chaplains um, and repeatedly and have nursing staff ask if they could pray for them. Now, there, there are different levels of tolerance, if you like. Um, and some people were quite upset at the approaches they'd have if they were going in for a big operation. You, you don't want those sorts of approaches sometimes. So we used to discuss it. And we said, well, perhaps people would like to have a humanist chaplain. Mm. And of course, the word grates on everybody because there just isn't a better word. Mm. And we wanted to be part of the system. Okay. So we said, fine, you will, we'll look into this. And um, mm. so I was delighted to you know, be asked if I'd be the first one. So we were at the very yeah. early stages, but um, so that at least if people go in, there's a number the hospital yeah. staff can ring. And were you, were, were you elected as chaplain or were you asked to perform? I was role? asked. They, they, yeah. Some of the uh, members decided they'd set up a committee mm. to look at how they'd approach things. And mm. they said, well, first we'll ask a chaplain. And so they asked me, because they know my background as well, you know, um, they know my CV, if you like. Um, so they asked me and I said, yes, I'd mm. be very pleased to do it. And this version of humanism, once again, I'm going to use your mm. phrase, with mm. the capital H, um, has this idea of humanism been in Ireland for very long? It's, it's actually probably longer than um, you might think, considering mm. the number, few number of people who actually know about it. There, I mean, there have been free thinkers and people with no religion going mm. a, a long way back. But I would say in possibly the 60s, when I, I think the media have... Um, some responsibility in this area, um, and uh, and birth control probably uh, people began to say, oh, you know, maybe we're grown up now as a society and we can think for ourselves. Mm. And some people were looking for an alternative to marriage ceremonies, um, uh, funerals especially. And so I'd say from the 60s, there were different groups in separating church and state campaigns. Then in the 90s, I think as we are now, humanism became to be more recognised. Mm. And even since the 90s, do you think the role of the humanist in society has changed? I, I think there's more under, there are more people who know, who've heard of, what, of humanism mm. and who so don't need to start from the very basics and I think there are more people who realise that we are actually quite normal people, we just don't happen to believe in any of the gods that other people believe in. Um, so I would be very happy if everybody in the country knew what humanist was, even if they said, well I don't want to be one and I don't want to join, but it, just so long as they knew that there was that option for them. And of course, you've had recent awareness has been re boosted recently with your visit to Oris and Uthoran on St. Patrick's Day. And what, what was that experience like? Well, it, it's delightful. I mean, we went, um, I think there have been other visits. I think Mary Robinson um, mm. entertained some humanists before Mary McAleese um, a year or two ago. We went to a garden party with other community groups which was fantastic. And then I think Michael D. Higgins um, asking for a humanist celebrant um, mm. uh, woman at, at his inauguration was mm. fantastic. Uh, and so we, we are just now almost automatically on a lot of lists for mm. invitations. And it's just nice being part of the Irish community, you mm. know, of the country, not just, you know, our own little community. Mm. It's, um, and it's nice because we talk to other groups. Yes. All, all sorts of different groups, so so it's very nice to be invited and accepted. And does that give you a sense of worth within your own community that you can share your beliefs with other mm. people? Yes, it, it's 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 um, it's all for us about letting people know that we're here and uh, 
the, the I, I mean, I, I part wrote the the uh, speech for the inaugural, um, not Michael Dees, <laughs> the human <laughs> um, because we knew that he would be someone with um, a pluralist approach and integrating everybody to make ev nobody feel outside of society. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'm going to hand over to my Thank colleague, you. James Martin, now. He will conduct the second half of the interview. Thank you. Thank you very much. James, <coughs> thank you for joining us. Um, I'd like to begin with talking about humanism as a whole and within Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, we live in a country now that still has a lot of schools that are under the patronage of the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. um, would you like to, and religion is obviously still taught in schools, would you like to see humanism being taught in schools, or maybe schools concentrating on other religions? Um, I would like to see a school in, you know, an ideal world um, where children are taught to cooperate with each other, to be with each other, to look at issues together, to not be separated according to the religion of their parents. Um, we think it's very important that children learn about all aspects of the world. You know, how to treat the world, how other people live in other countries, the experience of people in this country, so that they learn about things, basically. What we do think is very wrong is that children are instructed in the doctrine of their religion during, in, in state schools, in publicly funded schools, that their education is about things, not into things. So you talked about that separation. Would you like to see a humanist school, or do you feel that a school should ha be open to all religions and all religions should be taught within the school? Yes, I, I mean, I, I, th there was an issue in England, uh, uh, the UK, because some of the schools were faith schools, and people said, well, well, you can have your own schools. And we said, we don't want our own schools. We want children together <laughs> and you know there's plenty of time outside of school for Sunday school for parents to instruct in their religion and um, we think no child should ever be separated for um, you know faith convictions of their parents which you know that if, if they give them at home that's part of their family decision part of what they want to do state funded schools and state paid teachers should be taught to teach about the world and, to, and teach children to think for themselves. And what do you think of the label that Ireland still has as a Catholic nation? It, it'll be there a long time. I mean, it still is basically a very Catholic country. It's, um, it's, not, it's not a theocracy, it's, um, but it is a very Catholic country. I mean, that's, that's the way things are. I, I mean, obviously, personally, I would like to live in a country where people were democratic, did what they want, and uh, if people want to be Catholic, uh, you know, I'm very happy for them, it's great, but I just don't think there should be privilege attached to numbers. Um, you know, if, I mean, the census figures are going up increasingly with people signing no religion, and if there were more no religious people than Catholics. It doesn't mean we think the Catholics shouldn't have any rights or be able to um, follow their own religion and conscience. Yeah, you mentioned the census there. The last uh, 2011 census showed figures going up to 44.8% of people marking no religion. Why do you think it has gone up in recent times? Um, Probably not because of our campaign, which is quite small scale. Um, but I think there is, there is more media coverage of of the of the issues. Um, and in fact, considering the way the whole census question is posed, in the presumption that there is that you do have a religion, it asks simply which religion do you have. And so people, because most people don't care, um, just the, the first box is what they're familiar with, what they probably are, what they were christened and confirmed as. Um, so so that, the figure is going up. Our, our question to the, uh, to the government is, what do you do with those figures? You know, do you base any services on those figures? And, and maybe the question shouldn't be, which or do you have a religion? Perhaps it just shouldn't be there. 
you know, perhaps that is something that is personal. Um, There's so many places in Irish society today that religion is very much a part of daily life. I mean, people swear on the Bible mm, in court, mm. and the national broadcaster pauses for the Angelus. Would you like to see those things maybe been taken out of everyday Irish society? I, I think it, it's part of this presumption of being that because you live in a Catholic country, everybody in it is Catholic and everybody enjoys all those things. Definitely we are campaigning for the removal of the oath for president, uh, well, a religious declaration uh, to be president and judge and lots of state offices. Um, the, the preamble to the constitution is full not only of <coughs> religion, but it's a fairly specific religion. So that excludes a lot of people from it. Um, the Angelus, I mean, th th there's a list of priorities, and I mean education would be up there, um, health care <coughs> for all, regardless of, you know, religious chaplains and so on. Um, the, the Angelus, I'd, I'd prefer it wasn't there, but I don't lose too much sleep. Some people have argued that it's so much part of Ireland's history, if you look back at mm. the famine times where people gather at mass rocks just in order to pray under threat of death. Some people might say that if you take those things away now, we might be, in a sense, losing some of our history. What do you think of that, the way that it is very much embedded into the history of the country? I think things evolve and change. And I think what we're seeing with, say, the census figures is that people are just... Things will change. You can't live in the past. There will always be that history. Uh, and no one should ever forget the famine um, and the consequences. And, but we're not in the famine now. Uh, and I think things change. So I, I, so I think it'll be slow. And I don't think... That, and nobody's going to have their religion taken away from them overnight or the history of the country. But I think it will change. And do you think the recent scandals with the Catholic Church have added to people moving away from it and maybe towards humanism or atheism? I, they, I, they may well have added to people moving away from the church. And certainly if you look at the Count Me Out um, site where, where people could say, I, you know, I'm, I'm not happy with what's been done, take my name off this. We were very happy those thousands didn't come to us. They made their mark, they made their point. We, we want people who want to be humanists, not people who are unhappy with the church, if you see the difference mm -hmm. between yeah. the two. Um, again, I think it's, it's just a gradual, it's a gradual thing, people, because, I mean, certainly I remember as a child, you were, if there was a question, the answer was in the catechism, or the priest told you. Somebody always had your answer. And now I think people have to think a bit more for themselves. And growing up ethical is really important for humanists, um, that, that you actually think about whether something is right and wrong. Be because you often know yourself without having to say, you know, I look on page three, is this right, is this wrong? Um, it's tough. You know, you have to make your own decisions about your own life. I'd like to talk a little bit about um, some of the ceremonies that mm. the humanism, mm. cer humanist ceremonies. Um, there's ones that would be equal to marriage, there's ones that would be equal to a funeral. Could you explain a little bit about yeah, the sure. different ones and what they involve? Yeah, delighted to. Um, because I think that's really the ground from where humanism came, because all humans have a desire to celebrate a birth a joining of a couple um, to mourn, but in a way celebrate a life in a, in a funeral. And they sometimes, if they don't have a religion, they don't want to do it, you know, in a service. So a naming ceremony is very simple usually. Uh, discuss with the family what they want. People bring songs, poems, they welcome a child in. The marriages, people, with celebrant, a celebrant will work with a couple to say, you know, how do you want to do your marriage? Where are we going to do it? And so on, and choose the wording. Now, we were hoping in 2004 to be added to the list when they increased the list of people who could perform marriage legally. 
and I don't know if you've seen, but it's um, Ivana Bacic has been leading campaign to it's had its reading in the Senate. So we're hoping that soon we will be able to perform marriages legally. Um, the figures are quite um, uh, very, very large now for people who have a civil marriage. I forget exactly what they are, but it's 30, 40 percent, I think. And even though those, some of those are second marriages where people can't marry in a church, they, um, you know, it, it is an indication, I think, of the fact that people want to be married, a, eh, um, and want to make it a public commitment, but they don't necessarily regard it as a religious thing. And the, in, in terms of percentage, although we, you know, we, we don't do thousands of funerals, but in terms of percentages, they are rising faster for us in the marriage ceremonies because I think there have been some quite public figures who've had chosen to have humanist funerals. And people see it's actually a very, very good experience. Um, that person's life is marked. Some of the deaths are tragic, and you have somebody who will work with the family sensitively to celebrate the life, to respect the mourning of the family and friends. And the idea of religion after a death and in the mourning period is a great source of comfort for some people. Mm. They believe that their loved one is somewhere else, and they draw upon that. Is there? Do many humanists struggle with that aspect when a loved one dies? I don't think they struggle with the thing about not seeing them again. Uh, in, in terms of that they're sorry they don't have a belief in an afterlife. Obviously they'll miss the person. But I think if your belief, like mine, is that, that when someone dies, you won't see them anymore, but you'll feel them. They will always be part of your experience. Um, I, I don't think many people do really convert on their deathbed, to be honest. <laughs> and, and so if someone close to me has died, I'm very sad. I go through all the normal things. But I've never really, even as a child when I was going to church, I don't think I ever actually expected to see anybody after I died. So. And it's funny, I talk to children sometimes in Educate Together schools and uh, some of them, the first thing they, they're dying to ask you is, literally, not literally, um, is, you know, doesn't it make you sad? And I say, well, no, it, it doesn't. Um, and uh, one of them once said to me, but what if somebody's had a really awful life on earth? <laughs> Don't they deserve a good life afterwards? And I said, well, you know, it'd be nice to think they, they deserved a good life on earth. But... Um, so, so no, it's just, just not, um, it's just not part of something that's in your mentality to expect it, so you don't miss it. And how would you think um, some humanists in foreign countries with very strict religious laws, like blasphemy laws, mm. right, how do you think they struggle against that? Well, I know they struggle. Um, they, they struggle. Um, I mean... I, I mean, you know, you can talk about human rights and you should have the right to, one of your human rights is to be able to leave a religion if you want. Some people don't dare. They, they would be killed um, or ostracized from their families, which might be almost as bad for them. So it, it is difficult. I, in many countries, there is an international humanist, an ethical union, it's called, that's the international body, um, which tries to give support to people all around the world um, and I don't know if it's most but there are certainly huge numbers of humanist groups and atheist groups around the world different countries before I go to questions um, from the audience could I ask who you think some of the great champions of humanism and atheism would have been throughout the throughout history um, There are people, sorry, I'm probably not going to give you a big list here because, sorry, I wasn't prepared for that. There, okay. there, are, <coughs> there are all sorts of people who've led the way um, in different times. And I suppose if you go back even to some of the Renaissance humanists, mm -hmm. who you might think were still actually religious, um, they lived in a time when 
it was it would have been you know quite dangerous and they might have been ostracized ostracized themselves um, and and there are people who are religious or would have were religious Martin Luther King and so on who we would respect their values even you know they came from a religious background but their values would still tally with a lot of ours as to equality and freedom and so on okay thank you yeah. I'd like to open up the floor if there's any yeah. questions from the audience uh, feel free to ask And you mentioned about sort of the ethical and humanist international body, and I would just like to know, sort of, is the maybe the, the doctrine, for want of a better word, of the humanist society, is it particular to each country, or is there an international sort mm. of set of principles or guidelines that everybody would sort of, I suppose, grow into or, or adhere to? Yeah, thank you. Um, there is what's called the Amsterdam Declaration. I think it originally was written in 1952 and it was updated in 2002, um, which has a set of, I think, fairly universal values. There are about seven altogether, I think, and they are things like appreciation of beauty, um, treating science as something for the benefit of humanity rather than just for knowledge for itself. Um, the pe democracy, um, the equality that I was just talking about, that, that everybody should be equally treated and have equal rights. And obviously we, we know around the world some people don't even get education, which we, of course, you know, we're arguing about, you know, which flavour of religious education you might get where some people, you know, barely uh, get a school. So uh, rationality would be something that is, is prized, but of course we, we, we're still humans and we recognise that, that humanity that says we're not totally good. I, I am sure that in the Enlightenment there was this hope that eventually we would all reach such a stage that we would reach perfection. I, I, think, um, I think we've recognised that's a way off, uh, but it's there, you know, the good is there, the bad is there, and we have to work to make it um, to make it there. So the, they're the main sorts of things. Um, there are differences in different countries, say, about education, where there are some European countries where they do have humanist schools. There is the, the thing about parity rather than integration. There, there's a different powers, but each of those would be treated equally. That would be their stance. Um, we, we go more for, you know, that, that, that there should be integration. Uh, hi. Where religions that are ostensibly peaceful in recent years, um, like Christianity and Islam in particular, have been misinterpreted by zealots mm. who, who would seek to mm. propagate them uh, to the extent of violence and indeed some would say murder, is there the danger that humanist doctrines or indeed atheism um, by those who pursue it most militantly could be misinterpreted in the same way and that it could be manifested in the same way? Or is that an, a particularly religious problem? I, I, I can't see. I, I mean, we, we, you know, each group has its sort of in jokes, and you know, one of ours would be, you know, where's the first humanist war going to start? We, we're not planning a, you know, a violent takeover anywhere. Um, so, so I, 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 I can't see. I, I mean, if Richard Dawkins is the most militant we're going to get, I think we're safe from. Um, you know, from an atheist war just at the moment. But, um, yeah, I, I mean, people feel strongly about things. Um, I, I, I can't see it happening, and I certainly hope it never would. Thanks for coming along to us now. It's great to have somebody like yourself just sharing, and uh, we don't often get a chance maybe to hear oh. a lot about the humanist uh, organisation and tradition. Um, I'm, I have a question, I suppose, of curiosity more than anything else. Um, as a priest, you know, we, we gather each Sunday to celebrate a ritual, a Eucharist or whatever, as our community. I'm just wondering, you know, you, you said you, you meet, I think, once a month on a mm -hmm. Sunday. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious to know, what do you do at your meeting? <laughs> um, 
we meet, really. Is. Um, I, I think it's, it's like families at Christmas. No, I mean, I always have, and, and a few years ago, I remember, because all this was quite new, with different um, nationalities coming into the country and, um, and humanists, we, we would get for a few years, what do humanists do at Christmas? <laughs> well, we probably have a turkey if you're not a vegetarian. <laughs> we have presents and we probably drink. Um, so I think everybody, but within that, everybody has their family traditions. You know, what I would have done with my children and other people do. You have your own little traditions and... I mean, one of the, basically, at our Sunday meetings, which are always the first Sunday of the month, um, we either have a topic for discussion, we try not to make them always about religion, um, because, you know, we do um, want to have an ethical look at the world, so we look at, you know, some more philosophical questions. We sometimes have speakers come, and there's always time just to meet and chat. We don't, what we would, some of us would like to have um, is, is somewhere we could call our own, where you could make soup and do that more community thing. Um, so, it's, so it's basically just about chatting and giving people a chance to meet each, each week. And then we have an annual summer school, which is a cross-border thing. We have that with the Northern Irish humanists. And uh, that's become a tradition. So, so, so we're building our own small traditions, but um, I think if we ever felt, oh, this is embedded now, you have to, if there was ever you have to do this, then I think, oh, well, maybe we don't <laughs> do that. But it's nice to have that, that community to go to. And I think part of the chaplaincy thing as well is for people to have somewhere to go to. Um, the religion, whichever, you know, Church of England over there, and, Catholics here and Church of Ireland here. It, it is somewhere you can go to if you want that bit of extra support. It was part of the fabric of the community. And I, I think in a way that's a loss. I would have always wanted, even when I had small children, that there was that community feel within a village or a locality. So I, and I think that's something that's lost. Um, which is a great shame, and the more of us that are living in, in urban areas and, and conurbations, uh, we, we need to keep, people still need that local feeling to things. So. Because you're, you are, your whole belief is in humanity, where does your belief stand on uh, voluntary euthanasia? Um, we, the, one of the things, which I'm not sure if it's in the Amsterdam Declaration now, is about personal autonomy. And where someone's own life to them has lost um, their quality of life, you know, when they're very, very sick. And so, yes, we would be in favour of voluntary euthanasia on the whole, um, but we would obviously insist on very strict guidelines, medical guidelines, time, reflection on things, and as much support being offered to people as was humanly possible. But if someone at the end stage of their life said, I can't bear the pain, I, this quality of life is not how I want to see my days out, then we would like someone to be assisted in a humane way to, to have a dignified end to their life. Um, as much as I'm sure you'd welcome the increased secularisation of Irish education, the proposals being moved by Rory Quinn, the, in terms of, um, and for changes in the overall framework of Irish, particularly primary education, mm for humanist parents within the existing framework and the existing constraints that there are. <coughs> could you tell us a little about the difficulties faced by parents and some of the uh, practical ways of surmounting them? Mm. Um, the, the practical ways I, I'm not very, um, not very optimistic about at the moment, but we, I, uh, the emails come in to me and people will either ring or send an email and say, you know, we, we have no belief. God. My child is going to school because, because it may be the only, the only local school, may be a Catholic one or a religious one, I should say. Um, 
and they're coming home and they're talking about angels and things that they would never have heard of at home. And, and the parents, uh, but coming home in a way as if those things were true. Uh, and a lot of the parents find it very difficult. They're, I know children are, parents can take children out for the religious education lessons and some schools are very accommodating and very helpful about what the child does as an alternative or how they how it's managed within the classroom and we get feedback from parents saying that the school are very very supportive very helpful and it's no big deal others where you know child has been outside a classroom on a chair almost a naughty chair reading a book and, and it's obviously that's not acceptable um, we were hoping the new model of school would be more inclusive and are very disappointed that it's that whole, the community national schools are still separating children. They are still asking parents when they come in what faith group they want their child to be in. Or do you want them with the humanists and the polytheists? Um, because they're, they're sort of together and there are just aren't enough tables or rooms in the school for each religious group to be taught separately. Um, and so we, we're very um, unhappy with that model. It was an opportunity to have a model like an Educate Together model where children would be taught together, as we were talking about at the beginning, about religion and, and celebrating that people believe things, um, whatever their belief is. So we think that was a real lost opportunity and we're hoping that the pilots, they're proposing more pilot schools and we'd like those um, to be on hold while the thing is reviewed. That's great. <coughs> well, on behalf of myself, James Martin, Maeve McDonnell and the whole production team here, I'd like to thank uh, Anne James for coming in and uh, speaking to us today. That concludes the Talking Head series and to watch this or indeed any of the other six episodes back, you can log on to www.dcu.ie forward slash talkingheads. Thank you very much. Thank you.